Welcome to the next lesson. Uh, previously we looked at resisted horizontal motion. Today we're going to look at resisted vertical motion. So the first thing with vertical motion is that obviously we could be moving either up or down. We need to identify which way is going to be positive. Standard rule of thumb is whichever direction of motion that we have, that's going to be our positive direction. So if we're moving upwards, up would be positive. However, if we're moving down, then downwards would be positive. So obviously, uh, gravity is always pulling down to the Earth. The thing that we need to realize is that if we are moving up, gravity is working against us. And if we are moving down, gravity is working with us. Because in either of those situations, what's happening is that there's going to be some sort of resistance. The same way that we had resistance in horizontal motion, we've got resistance in vertical motion. So obviously, if we're moving up, well, then gravity forms uh, part of that resistance. If we're moving down, well, then it's just going to be some sort of air resistance. So even when we're in like free fall, for example, there's still going to be some sort of air resistance that we've got um, acting against us. Now, the thing that we have to consider is sometimes we're going to start on the ground and go up and then come back down. Think of like launching something up into the sky that then comes straight back down again. In those situations, we have to look at each part or each leg of that particular travel as two separate journeys. So the when we're going up, there's going to be a positive upward motion. But then when we come back down, we've got a positive downward motion. So if we try to um, deal with them both at the same time, then they kind of cancel each other out and stuff. And we don't want to do that. All right. Each individual uh, leg of that particular path are going to be treated as separate entities. So upwards. We'll look at that separately to downwards and we'll look at an example of that in a second. Now I was talking about free fall. Uh, here's a little video that will cover free fall. So even in free fall, there's going to be, well, we've got that air resistance against us, but we're going to get to a point where we can't go any faster, all right? We're going to uh, have no more acceleration, all right? That's our maximum velocity that we can reach. At that point, it's going to be a constant, all right? We're no longer accelerating. We're traveling at a constant velocity, and that maximum velocity is also known as terminal velocity, and we denote that as V subscript big T. So that's going to happen when acceleration is zero or uh, as time approaches infinity. And again, we'll look at an example where that actually happens. All right, so it doesn't matter uh, the force of gravity is pulling us down at a constant acceleration, but that wind resistance is counteracting that. We're going to get to a point where we can't fall any faster. Right? There's going to be a maximum velocity that we can reach. So here's another little video where we're going to be looking at uh, free fall. Specifically, this is someone who decided that they had lots of money and nothing better to do with it than to try and break the world record of the fastest speed that a human travels in free fall. Uh, do you read me, Felix? Activate suit and chest pack cameras. Alright, so that's Felix there. That's actually up in the capsule. Are on the computer now, he is currently uh, 24.2 miles up. Now 
he sets the record there now. There's a world out there. All right, stand up on the exterior step. Keep your head down, and our guardian angel will take care of you. And there he goes. So he actually uh, broke the record for the fastest person. So not only is he uh, falling back down to earth above, so he breaks the speed of sound. He's actually traveling at almost 1400 kilometers per hour. Right? 1400 kilometers per hour is the speed that he is traveling at, uh, at his greatest speed. So that would be his terminal velocity. He didn't go any faster than that. Crazy. Okay, let's look at a new rule for integrals. Now we've got here one over 25 minus x squared. We want to find the derivative of that. So you might instantly look at that and say, well, hang on, that looks like tan. Well, it's not because the top is not the derivative of the bottom. Now we have worked with situations where that's the case by a multiple that is a constant, not in terms of x. So we can't nicely turn this into tan. So there is a particular rule that we can use to find the integral of this. Now, this rule is not going to be on any formula sheet, nor is it one that you're really going to need to know, I don't think. Uh, but it's certainly one that's going to help us out as far as this mechanic stuff goes. So what we're going to do is we're going to just look at our fraction, 1 over 25 minus x squared. And hopefully we can look at the bottom and say, well, hang on. That's a difference of squares, right? I've got five squared minus x squared. So if I've got a difference of squares, I can expand that out. So what we're gonna get is one over five minus x or multiply by five plus x. So what I can do is I could also treat that thing there as being the sum of two individual fractions. Right? I can have some a over five minus x plus some b over five plus x. We're going to have to sort out what a and b actually are, but that will work, right? There is the two values for a and b that will give us a particular uh, solution. Now, if I want to add two fractions together that have different denominators, I need to cross multiply. So I can say that that's going to be exactly the same as a multiplied by 5 plus x plus b multiplied 5 minus x all over my 5 minus x multiplied by 5 plus x. So if I look back at my first step that I had there, the one over 25 minus x squared, well, since those two are equal, I can have my numerators equal. So if we just look at our numerators, we know that a five plus x plus b lots of five minus x is gonna equal one. So now we can go about solving for a and b. So let's multiply a and b through our brackets, and we're gonna get five a plus ax plus five b minus bx is equal to one. Now I've got two terms there that have x's in them, so let's group them together. So we've got 5a plus a minus b lots of x plus 5b equals 1. Now we know that a and b have to be some constants. So if a and b are constants and it's all of it adds up to 1, well a minus bx, a minus b has to be 0 because there's no x's in my right hand side there, I've just got a 1. So much like when we looked at um, imaginary versus real components. Here we've got numbers versus variable components. So there's no variable component there. So a minus b must be equal to zero. So if a minus b is equal to zero, therefore a must be equal to b. Well, that's handy. So then we know that though that x bit in the middle is going to clear out. We're just left with 5a plus 5b equals 1. Well, we know that a equals b, so I can just say that 5a plus 5b is exactly the same as 5a plus 5a equal to 1. Well, that means I'm going to have 10a equal to 1, so a must be 1 over 10. Likewise, so must b, because we know that a equals b. 
So now we can go back and we can write in our values of a and b. So, but rather than write one tenth over five minus x plus one tenth over five minus uh, five plus x, I'm going to pull that one tenth out the front. So what we've got is that my one over twenty-five minus x squared is the same as one tenth of one over five plus x plus one over five minus x. So since I can equate those two fractions, I can now say that my integral of dx over 25 minus x squared is the same as the integral of 1 tenth of 1 over 5 plus x plus 1 over 5 minus x dx. Of course, I can pull that uh, 1 tenth out the front of my integral sign. So now we have ourselves a much easier thing that we can find integrals of. Uh, especially as, like I said, that 1 over 25 minus x squared might look like tan, but it isn't. So now we can find that. Well, the integral of 1 over 5 plus x is going to be the natural log of 5 plus x. And likewise, 1 over 5 minus x is going to be the natural log of 5 minus x. And then, of course, we've got our constant of integration on the end. Now, if we remember our log laws, if I've got the log of something minus the log of something else, well, it's just going to be a division, right? So what we've really got there is the natural log of 5 plus x over 5 minus x. Again, plus our constant on the end. So there's our final solution. Well, what do we notice about our original 1 over 25 minus x squared compared to 1 tenth of the natural log of 5 plus x over 5 minus x? Well, if, as I said before, it was a difference of squares, if we look at 25 as being a uh, 5 squared, well, now what we've got is 1 over 2 lots of 5 times the natural log of 5 plus x over 5 minus x. So I can switch out that 25 for 5 squared, and if we switch out 5 for some symbol, let's say alpha, well, now we've got that 1 over alpha squared minus x squared is going to be equal to 1 half, well, 1 over 2 lots of alpha times the natural log of alpha plus x over alpha minus x plus our constant of integration. All right, that rule is going to come in handy in our first example. Like I said, you don't need to know this. This isn't, certainly isn't in the curriculum as far as things that you need to know. You should be able to, however, if you're given an example of 1 over 25 minus x squared, you should be able to uh, follow that process that's there to get to an answer. All right, so let's apply it to an example. All right, example one. So we've got an object that's falling from rest and the retardation, which is the negative acceleration acting against it, uh, which is due to the air resistance, is 0 0.2 v squared meters per second per second. Now we want to use gravity equal to 9.8 meters per second per second to show that v is equal to 7 lots of e to the power of 2.8 t minus 1, all divided by e to the power of 2.8 t plus 1. Right? Those minus 1s and plus 1s are not part of the power. So what we've got is an object that's falling, so it's going down, so downwards is going to be our direction that it's traveling, so it's going to be our positive direction. So what that means is that gravity is helping us rather than resisting us. So gravity is going to be positive, but that air resistance R is going to be a negative. So the force is going to be the force of gravity minus the resistance. Now we know that force we can just rewrite as mass times acceleration. So we get MA is equal to 9.8 lots of M minus 0.2 lots of M times the velocity squared. Now, we don't know what the mass of our object is, but it doesn't matter because all of those terms have an m, so I can divide everything by m. So then we're left with a is equal to 9.8 minus 0 0.2 times the velocity squared. Now, I don't like working with decimals, don't know about you. So how about we multiply both of those two numbers by 10, but then represent it as a fraction over 10. And rather than use A, our ultimate goal is to get to V. So we're just going to rewrite acceleration as dV dt. So then we get dV dt is equal to 98 minus 2V squared all over 10. Now, if I look at those three numbers, they're all even, so I can divide them all by 2. 
So now we've got that dv dt equals 49 minus v squared, all divided by 5. Now I want to have all of my v's on the left, so I'm going to switch out my dt with 49 minus v squared. And then we get that dv over 49 minus v squared is equal to dt over 5. So what we need to do now is take the integral of both sides. So I can pull out my 1 fifth out the front. We're going to have 1 fifth of the integral of dt, which we should realize is just going to be t. Now on the left hand side, normally we'd have to do a lot of work, but we've just had a look at that wonderful new integral rule. So we've got 49 minus v squared, that's a difference of squares. So that's 7 squared minus v squared on the bottom. So remember that when I've got that 7 squared, I'm going to have 1 over 2 lots of 7 out the front. So we're going to have 1 over 14 lots of the natural log of 7 plus v over 7 minus v. And that's equal to 1 fifth of t plus, of course, our constant of integration. Now, when we drop this thing, it's starting at rest. So at time zero, it's got zero velocity. So we're going to use that to solve for a value of c. So when t is zero, v is also zero. So substituting those in and we get 1 14th multiplied by the natural log of 7 plus zero over 7 minus zero is equal to 1 fifth of zero plus c. Well, 1 fifth of zero is just zero. So on the right hand side, we're going to have c. 7 plus 0 is 7, 7 minus 0 is also 7, so we're going to have 7 over 7, so that's the natural log of 1. And of course the natural log of 1 is 0, so that means c must also be 0, which is handy, c just goes away and we can rewrite our expression as such. Now remember we want to get up to v equals, that part at the top there, so that's what we're going to have to do. So let's go through that. First thing I see is a whole lot of fractions. Let's get rid of those. So if I multiply both sides by 14, that'll get rid of the 1 14th on the left. So the natural log of that big fraction is equal to 14 over 5 lots of t. How do I get rid of that natural log on the left? Well, I raise everything to the power of e. So we're going to have e to the power of the natural log of that fraction means I'm just going to have that fraction on the left and then e to the power of 14 over 5 lots of t. We're running out of space, so let's clear a bit of space on the left. So now I want to get rid of that fraction on the left, so let's multiply both sides by 7 minus v. And we're going to have 7 plus v is equal to 7 minus v lots of e to the 2.8t. So let's multiply that e to the 2.8t through the bracket. And we're going to have 7 lots of e to the 2.8t minus ve to the power of 2.8t. All right, so again, this is where we want to have all of our v's on one side. So then let's bring our negative ve over to the left and take our 7 that's on the left hand side over to the right. So I've got all my v's equals numbers. And we're going to have v plus ve to the 2.8t equals 7 e to the 2.8t minus 7. Well, on the left-hand side, I can factor out a v, and on the right-hand side, I can factor out a 7. So we're going to get that there. So now what I want to do is just have my v by itself on the left-hand side, so I'm going to divide both sides by 1 plus e to the 2.8t. And we're left with our original uh, expression that we wanted to get to. All right, we had to do a little bit of maths to get there, but we eventually got there. Now, let's say you came across this question in an exam and it wants you to do that. And you say, well, hang on, it's two marks. That means it's going to be three minutes. I don't think I can solve that in three minutes. Skip part A and move on to part B, because I guarantee you the rest of the question, you can use that V equals seven lots of that fraction. All right, you'll be able to use that. So skip part A if you want, if you feel like you don't have the time in an exam, but then you can just move on to part B. So let's do that now. For part B, we want to show that the displacement x is equal to five times the natural log of e to the 2.8t plus 1 minus 7t minus five times the natural log of 2. Now we know from part A, our velocity is equal to that. 
we want to get to displacement, so V, we're going to rewrite that as dx dt. Our goal is then that we're going to integrate this so that we can get x by itself. Now, if I look at that fraction on the right, that's not something that's easily going to integrate. So I'm going to have to do some mathematical rearranging there to get that into some form where I can easily integrate it. So looking at our denominator, if I could get my numerator to be the derivative of that, then we could just do the integral of it and we'd get a natural log. But because I've got that minus one on the top, it's not going to nicely integrate, so I need to get rid of that constant minus one. The way that we're going to do that is I'm going to change my numerator to be more like my denominator. Then I can hopefully pull something out and cancel out that negative one. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to pull out a negative factor so that everything on my numerator is going to switch signs and my seven out the front is going to become a negative. So my negative one is turned to a plus one so that we're on the right track. Now I've got a negative e to the 2.18 and I really I want that to be positive. Now there's no point multiplying it by a negative, we're just going to get back to where we started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat that negative e as being the resultant of some other sum. Well, what sum will get me negative e? Well, if I start with negative 2e and I add 1e, well, then I would get a negative e. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to split that up into two bits so that my negative e to the 2.8t is really the same as e to the 2.8t minus 2e to the 2.8t. Right, if I was to simplify the numerator on the third row, I would get my numerator on the second row. So now what I've got is an e to the 2.8t and a plus 1. So I can pull them aside and have that as its own little fraction. All right, if I was to simplify that last line there, I would get the line before it. So now on the left, what I've really got is just 1. Right, that, that's nicely going to simplify down to 1. And I'm left with negative 2e to the 2.8t over e to the 2.8t plus 1. So now we're getting to a point where we can easily integrate. So I can easily integrate dx dt, the negative 7s are constant out the front, uh, the 1 we can easily integrate, so we're just left with that fraction. You will notice that the numerator is not the derivative of the denominator. So because it's not, it's not going to easily work. We're going to have to pull something out. Well, how many times different is it? Well, we've got that multiplying it by 2 at the moment, so if we were to pull that out, what we would have then is a number that is 2.8 times too small. So what we need to do then is it's really being divided by 2.8. So that if I rewrite it, my integral of dx dt will become x, the negative 7, constant out the front. The integral of 1 becomes t. So like I said, we had to pull out the 2 and then divide it by the 2.8. Now what we're left with is the natural log of e to the 2.8t plus 1. All right, that's our denominator. That will nicely, if we were to find the derivative of that, we would nicely get our previous line. Don't forget we've got to add a plus c, our constant of integration, on the end. All right, so the next thing is we're going to have to multiply that 7, or negative 7, I should say, through the bracket. So we're going to get negative 7t plus 14 over 2.8 times the natural log of e to the 2.8t plus 1 plus our constant of integration. All right, so 14 divided by 2.8, well, that's nice. That's 5. That worked out nicely, doesn't it? So that's a nice uh, expression there. So what? Uh, I'm just going to rearrange that so that we've got our 5 times the natural log of e to the 2.8t plus 1 minus 7t plus c. All right, we need to find out what our constant of integration is going to be. Now, remember, this is an object that we've dropped. So... What was its displacement at the start? Well, it was zero. So when t is zero, x is also zero, right? We have, it hasn't moved at the start. So I can substitute those values in. So we're gonna have that zero is equal to five times the natural log of e to the zero plus one minus seven lots of zero plus c. So we're gonna have the natural log of two inside my bracket there e to the 0 becomes 1, so 1 plus 1 is 2, so we've got 5 times the natural log of 2, minus 0, plus c. 
So then what we've got then is that C must be equal to the negative of 5 times the natural log of 2. Because then if I was to substitute that in for C, I would get 0 on the right hand side. So now I can put that back into my previous line where we had x was equal to 5 times the natural log of e to the 2.8t plus 1 minus 7t plus c. That plus c is now going to become minus 5 times the natural log of 2. And lo and behold, we've shown that that is indeed our displacement. Now, much like I said at the end of part A, if you're not sure how to do it, you can skip on to the next part. Likewise, if in part B you don't know how to actually uh, show that that's the displacement, you can move on to part C, where you've got now both the velocity and the displacement given to you. All right, you were given velocity in part A and had to show it. You've been given displacement here in part B and had to show it. But if you don't know how to do that, go on to part C and just use the formulas as stated in the question. So let's look at part C. We want to find the terminal velocity of the object. So remembering our terminal velocity is going to be when t approaches infinity. So if we look at our velocity, we've got that seven lots of all of that. Well, what's going to happen as t approaches infinity? So let's just look at our fraction. So if we've got e to the infinity minus 1 divided by e to the infinity plus 1, well, e to the infinity minus 1, well, that minus 1 is so small, we're going to be left with infinity. Likewise, on the bottom, the plus 1 is so small, we're going to be left with infinity. So both my numerator and my denominator, as t approaches infinity, they will each approach infinity. So then what's infinity divided by infinity? Well, that's 1. All right, so as t approaches infinity, our bracket, everything inside our bracket, will approach 1. So then that means that as t approaches infinity, our whole velocity is going to approach 7, because we've got 7 lots of 1. So that means that our terminal velocity is going to be 7 metres per second. Now, we started off by saying that our terminal velocity occurs as t approaches infinity, the other way we can work out our terminal velocity is it occurs when the acceleration is zero. So when is our acceleration zero? Well, we were given that, well, we worked that out, I should say, that that was going to be 9.8 minus 0 0.2 times the velocity squared. All right, so when is that going to happen? Well, that's when 9.8 equals 0 0.2 times the velocity squared, divide both sides by 0 0.2, and we get when 49 is equal to v squared. Well, we could have used our other formula where we had uh, 49 minus v squared all over 10. It would, we'd still get to this exact same point. Uh, sorry, over 5. So 49 equals v squared. We take the square root of both sides. So therefore, our terminal velocity is 7 meters per second. So it doesn't matter which way you go. You will get out our terminal velocity is 7 meters per second. Polaris missiles arrive at Cape Canaveral for their first test firings from the nuclear submarine expressly designed for the job, USS George Washington. The tests are a stirring climax to a four-year program to mate the nuclear submarine and the intermediate-range ballistic missile. Now the sub's missile hatches are cleared and ready. They'll house the 28-foot two-stage rockets until the moment when mighty gusts of compressed air will shoot the Polaris from under the sea to the surface and ignition. So we have here a demonstration that Tristan's going to show us. Missile tube, compressed air, all we need is a missile. So I place the missile in the missile tube. Three, two, one, fire. Thank you very much. But that's not very representative, is it? Because clearly the submarine is going to be underwater, so the tube will be full of water. This is a much more realistic and representative setup. We've got the missile in the tube on the whole rig underwater. So the missile has to not only get through the tube, but also has to overcome the depth of water and the pressure above it. So Tristan, let's see what happens. Ready? Three, two, one, fire. So, rather disappointing. So what's the solution? Here we've got an arrangement with the missile. It's sitting in a dry tube with a seal on top of it. The question is whether that creates enough momentum where the missile breaks through the seal, whether it can get through the water 
that sits on top of it. Tristan, let's see what happens. Okay, ready to fire. Three, two, one. All right, so it didn't fire very well when it was in a wet tube because what happened was we had the air behind it and once the missile had gotten to the top of the tube the air escaped and there was no longer any pressure behind it forcing it out. So what they ended up doing was they decided well let's have it inside a, an air tube so that it's got a breakout and then it's going to have that uh, force still behind it pushing it through a liquid. So what we're going to look now is something being forced through something where we've got uh, a viscosity or some sort of resistance, i.e. a missile, firing through water. Now we have an object of mass m that's going to be projected vertically upwards with an initial velocity of v0 in a medium where it's got a resistance of mkv. So m is going to be our mass, v is going to be velocity, and k is some constant of resistance. So if, for example, we were firing a missile through water, that k would represent that water is denser than air. Now we want to prove that the maximum height can be represented by VO over K plus G over K squared times the natural log of G over G plus KVO. So this time we're launching something up, so that means it's going upward, so our positive direction is up. We always need to state that because then that helps us to explain what we're doing with gravity. So we're going up this time, so gravity is going to be a negative, all right? That's a force pulling down, acting against us. So mass times acceleration is going to be equal to negative mass times gravity, take away mkv. Again, we can divide m out of all of those, and we're left with acceleration equals negative g minus kv. Now we don't want acceleration, we want to get it in terms of x, so we're going to have to write a as dv dx, but remember that a does not equal dv dx, it is actually equal to v times dv dx. So v times dv dx is equal to negative g minus kv. Now I want to get rid of that v on the left, so we'll divide both sides by v. So now we've got dv dx is equal to negative g minus kv over v. Now, I don't like the negative on our numerator, so let's factor that out, and we're going to get negative g plus kv over v. So that's dv dx, but our goal is to get to x, so we're going to have to flip both of those fractions. So we've got dx over dv is equal to negative v over g plus kv. So our ultimate goal, again, is going to be to integrate this. But again, our numerator there is not the derivative of our denominator. So we want to rewrite our numerator in terms of our denominator. So the first thing that I notice is there's no g, so I'm going to have to add a g on there. But if I'm adding a g, I have to take a g. All right, so g minus g cancels out and that would go away. Next thing is my v on the top is not a kv, so I'm going to have to multiply that by k. So 1 over k, lots of kv, they would cancel each other out. Uh, plus g minus g, we would just be left with v. So we haven't done anything different there. Now, this next step is a little bit hard to wrap your head around. That top line is exactly the same as saying it's 1 over k outside of the whole thing. Because I was to multiply that 1 over k through, we're going to get g over k plus v minus g over k. Well, what's g over k minus g over k? Well, zero, that cancels out and they go away. All right, so by having that out the front, we're not actually changing anything, All right? While technically g is not the same as g over k, they are still gonna cancel each other out. So we can actually cheat that a little bit. So now what we've got inside my bracket is a g plus kv over g plus kv minus a g over g plus kv. So that's going to nicely simplify to 1 minus g over g plus kv. Is my numerator now the derivative of my denominator? Not quite, it's because we've got a g there. So what we're going to need to do is pull out a g. Now what we should really have on the top is a k, but we don't have a k, so we're going to have to divide by k. So now when I take the integral of that, dx dv is going to become x. My negative 1k stays out the front. My 1 is going to integrate to a v, 
and that fraction is going to integrate to negative g on k lots of the natural log of my denominator g plus kv and of course some constant of integration on the end. So what do we know? Well we know that when we launch my displacement is zero when time is zero and then my velocity is going to be initial velocity v0 so I can substitute those in. So when x is zero v is v0 so then zero is going to be equal to negative one on k lots of vo minus g on k times the natural log of g plus kvo plus my constant of integration. So if all of that has to equal zero, well, my constant of integration must be everything that's at the first half there, my negative one k, but this time it's going to be positive so that they cancel each other out, uh, lots of vo minus g on k times the natural log of g plus kvo, right? So that's my c. Whew. So now let's rewrite all of that. So x is equal to negative one on k lots of v minus g on k times the natural log of g plus kv plus what was c one on k lots of vo minus g on k times the natural log of g plus kvo. Whew. So I can pull out a factor of one on k and I'm going to rearrange those two brackets so that I've got the positive minus the negative. So my VO will go first and the V will go second. So let's just do that. I've pulled out my 1K and then I've switched the two brackets around on the inside. So I've got the positive minus the negative. So then let's take that negative through the second bracket so I can get rid of the brackets inside the square bracket. And we're going to be left with 1 on K lots of VO minus G on k times the natural log of g plus kvo minus v plus g on k times the natural log of g plus kv. All right, so what have we got there? I don't want to simplify by multiplying through that 1k. Let's leave that alone. Let's just look at what we've got inside those square brackets. So I've got vo minus v, and then I've got a negative and a positive of my g on k times the natural log of individual things. So if I've got a, uh, a negative and an addition, well then my rule of log say that it's just going to be my positive one divided by the negative one. So that gives me plus g on k times the natural log of the positive one, g plus kv, divided by the negative one, g plus kvo. All right, so we've now got an equation for displacement, but that's not what we want. We want to prove that its maximum height can be represented by that bit at the top. So when will our maximum height occur? Well, you think about it, when we launch it, it's going to get up to a point and then it's going to fall back down. But when it reaches that top point, that maximum height, what's its velocity going to be? Well, its velocity is going to be zero. All right, so our maximum height occurs when velocity equals zero. So what we're going to have to do now is substitute that in for v. Not for v0, that's our initial velocity, but just for v. So when we substitute in, uh, zero in for v, we get that x is now equal to that. Now we're on the top of my fraction there, we've got g plus k lots of zero. Well, that's going to go away and we're just left with uh, g on g plus k v zero. Um, a minus zero inside the bracket, well, that disappears as well. That doesn't mean anything, and we're left with that. So now what I want to do is multiply by my one on k. So what we're going to have then is vo on k. We're going to have g on k divided by k. So what that means is we're going to have g on k squared times the natural log of g over g plus kv zero, which is what we wanted to prove. Therefore, QED, we've proved it as shown. All right, so there was a little, quite a bit of uh, algebraic manipulation we had to do to get there. Again, the thing that you have to remember is your log laws. All right, so that was part A. Let's move on to part B. So now we want to prove that the time it takes to reach that maximum height is going to be when t is equal to 1 on k times the natural log of g plus kvo over g. Well, we know that our acceleration, we worked that out previously, was equal to negative g minus kv. 
So that's our acceleration. So remember, we can write acceleration as dv dt. All right, so there's an acceleration that we had from part A. So what is that really? Well, that's dv over dt. We want to get to t, so let's flip it. So now what we're going to have is dt on dv is 1 over negative g minus kv. But again, we don't like that minus, so it's going to be minus 1 over g plus kv. So what is t going to be? Well, we want to find the integral. Is the top the integral of the bottom? Just about. We're a k factor out, so we're going to have to have a 1k out the front. But t is now negative 1 on k times the natural log of g plus kv plus some constant of integration, this time d. Ideally, we don't want to get our constants of integrations confused when we're in one specific question. We're in different parts of the same question, but it's still the same question. So we don't want to use c again. But what that means is we're going to have to figure out what is d. Well, we know that when t was 0, our velocity is going to be v0. So we can substitute that in. When t is 0, v is v0. Therefore, 0 is equal to negative 1 on k times the natural log of g plus kv0 uh, plus our constant of integration d. So if all of that has to equal 0, well, then d must be the positive of that. So d must be 1 on k times the natural log of g plus kv0. So now we can rewrite t. Now that we know what our d is, again, we've got minus 1 on k times of the natural log plus 1 on k lots of a natural log. So we've got that same 1 on k constant out the front, so we can just do a division. So it's going to be the positive over the bottom. So t is 1 on k times the natural log of the positive bit, g plus kvo, over the negative part, which is g plus kv. All right, so there's our equation for t. So at any point, we can find the time given velocity. Now, what we want, though, is to find its maximum height. So when is our maximum, gonna height, uh, maximum height going to occur? Well, again, it's the same thing. It's when v is equal to 0. So if we substitute in v is equal to 0, we get that time is going to be 1 on k times the natural log of that. Now, k times 0 on the bottom is going to go away, so we're just going to be left with g plus kv0 over k, which is what we wanted to show. That was a relatively easy one, part b. So we've worked out what our maximum height is. We've worked out when our maximum height is going to occur. Now we can move on to part c. So given that our initial velocity is our terminal uh, velocity divided by 2, or half of our terminal velocity, show that the velocity v of the object on returning to its original launch point satisfies the equation kv on g plus the natural log of g on g minus kv plus a half plus the natural log of two thirds is equal to zero. All right, so we're just looking at the second part of its journey. It was launched, it's reached its maximum height, and now it's returning back down to its launch point. So we're just looking at, at the point where it's, it's starting at its maximum height and it's returning back down to where it started from. So we've, we're starting at the top and we're heading down now. So that means that downwards is now our positive direction. So that means that mass times acceleration is going to be equal to mass times gravity minus mkv. Right? Gravity is helping us this time, so it's going to be a positive. Divide everything by m and we get that a is equal to g minus kv. So... We know that our terminal velocity is going to occur when our acceleration is equal to zero. So I'm just going to have g minus kvt equal to zero. Right? When our velocity is our terminal velocity, the acceleration is equal to zero. So it is important that v, we now change that to be vt and not just v. Well, I can take g away from both sides. We get that negative g is equal to negative kvt. Divide both sides by negative k, and we're going to get that vt is equal to g on k. Now, we know it was given to us that vt on 2 is equal to the initial velocity. So that means twice the initial velocity must be our terminal velocity. So I can switch out terminal velocity, therefore, twice our initial velocity. Divide both sides by 2, and we get our initial velocity must be g on 2k. So we knew that our a is g minus kv, so we can write that instead as v lots of dv dx being equal to g minus kv. 
So this is going to start to look very similar to what we did previously. The difference now is that because we're heading down, G is positive, not negative. So I want to divide both sides by V. So that DV dx is G minus KV on V. But again, we want to flip them so that we get DX DV is equal to V over G minus KV. We want to get our numerator looking like our denominator. So we want to add G and minus G. We want to multiply it by negative K. So if we're multiplying it by negative K, we're also multiplying it by negative one on K. So we're going to get that. Remembering that when we multiply that through, we're going to get G on K and minus G on K. They will cancel each other out. So it doesn't matter. So now what we've got inside my bracket is G minus KV over G minus KV. So that's going to become one. And we're left with negative G over G minus KV. Right, because we've looked at doing this before, I am skipping some steps this time around just to make things a little bit quicker. So now if that's dx dv, we can integrate both sides to work out what x is going to be. The top of our fraction there is the derivative of the bottom, except it's multiplied by g and not by k. So what it really is, is going to have a g on k factor in front of the natural log. So there is our displacement x is equal to negative 1 on k lots of v minus g on k lots of the natural log of g minus kv plus another constant of integration, this time e. So what do we know? Well, we know that when x is 0, our velocity is also 0. When x is 0, our velocity is zero, so we can substitute in those particular values, right? Because we're starting at the top. So zero is equal to negative one on k, lots of zero minus g on k, natural logs of g minus k zero, or plus e. So k times zero goes away, so we're just left with the natural log of g inside the bracket there. So what we've got is one, a negative one on k, lots of negative g on k, lots of the natural log of g plus our constant of integration e. So I'm going to multiply that negative 1 on k through. So we're going to get negative, we'll cancel out, and we're just going to be left with g on k squared, lots of the natural log of g plus e. So if all of that must equal 0, well then e is going to be the negative of that. So e is going to be the negative of g on k squared multiplied by the natural log of g. So now we can rewrite our displacement. Rather than having a plus e on the end, we've got our minus g on k squared, lots of the natural log of g. All right, so what can we do there? Well, we've got that one on k out the front of that first part. So I can put that what was e inside my bracket by pulling out a factor of one on k. So if that goes inside, instead of it being on k squared, it's just going to be on k. And the negative now becomes a positive. How is that helpful? I hear you cry. Well, what we've got now is plus g on k times a log minus g on k times a log. So we can use our log laws and we can have g over g minus kv inside the log there. All right, that made life just that little bit easier. So what are we trying to find? We're trying to find when it returns to the Earth. So we know that the distance from where it launched to its maximum height, so the distance from the maximum height back down to the bottom is going to be the same. Right? So our maximum height that we worked out is going to be the distance that this thing has to travel in order for it to return to its original launch point. So what we can do is we can set that displacement equation to be equal to its maximum height. So that's going to give us that, all right? We've got our maximum height on the left is equal to our displacement equation on the right. So we know that those two things have to be equal. So now what we want to do is do some manipulation and go through it. Well, what do we know? Well, we know that our initial velocity, VO, was going to be G on 2K. So we can substitute that in so that all my VOs are going to become G on 2K. So we're going to get G over 2K squared plus G over K squared times the natural log of G over 
g plus k lots of g on 2k being equal to all of that. Right, my right hand side, all I've done there is I've multiplied my negative one on k through the bracket. So we're going to have negative v on k minus g on k squared times the natural log of g over g minus kv. Whew. So now we want to actually go through. So what have we got? We've got inside the bracket, the first round bracket, we've got on our denominator g plus k times g on 2k. Well, those k's are going to cancel each other out, aren't they? So we're going to just have uh, g on 2. So what I want to do is I want to have both of them as g on 2. So if I've got g on 2 on the right, what is g? Well, that g is just 2g on 2. So I'm going to rewrite that as 2g on 2. All right, that's all I've done there. I've not changed anything else on the left-hand side. Right-hand side, haven't touched at all. So now what we've got is g divided by 3g on 2. Now, if we're dividing by 3g on 2, I can just multiply by the reciprocal, which is 2 on 3g. Okay, so all I'm doing at this point, just focusing on what's happening inside that bracket. So what's that going to look like? Well, what's going to happen is I'm going to have 2g over 3g. Well, the g's are going to cancel out, and I'm just going to be left with 2 on 3. Okay, so we've just got that 2 on 3 now inside that log. That's all we've done. Now, if we look at all of my terms that I've got there, all of them are being divided by some multiple of k. All of them are k squared, except for the first term on the right-hand side. That's by k. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply every single term there by k squared. So that'll get rid of the k squares out of three of the terms. But what we're going to have for that, what is now negative v on k, if I times that by k squared, we're going to have vk or kv. So if we multiply everything by k squared, we're going to get that. That's all we've done. We've multiplied everything by k squared. So now we don't have those horrible fractions. But that's not looking like where we want to get. So what else have we got in all of those terms? Well, wait, look. Again, with the exception of that uh, negative kv, all of the terms are multiples of g. So I can divide all of those terms by g. So what we're going to get then is 1 half plus the natural log of 2 thirds minus kv on g. Take the natural log of g over g minus kv. Well, let's throw everything all on the left hand side so that my two on the right hand side are going to go from negative to positives. And what we're going to have then is kv on g plus the natural log of g on g minus kv plus a half plus the natural log of two thirds being equal to zero, which is what we were required to show. All right, so we've had to do quite a lot of algebraic manipulation in example two, but hopefully there's nothing there that has been too much of a leap. But that finally brings us to the end. And there's our good friend Felix, just as he launched himself off uh, from his orbiting satellite that we got taken up there by a solar balloon. Uh, textbook is going to be exercise 706, which I believe is page 300. I hope everything's going well. But as always, if you're having any problems, uh, email or a message via Google Classroom and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Likewise, if there's anything in uh, any of the presentations, if I've skipped steps and you're not seeing how I'm getting from A to B, let me know and I can go back and address those issues. Otherwise, I hope everything's going well and I look forward to talking to you soon.